Uh, this is the third of four videos for the snowy day of January 27th. I want to start using the definition of the Riemann integral in terms of dyadic cubes to prove some theorems. These theorems, remarkably, are no harder to prove in n dimensions than in one dimension, though I'm going to ask you to prove them as proof 14.1 and 14.2 in two dimensions so you can draw meaningful diagrams. So let's suppose we've got two integrable functions from r and r, call them f and g. Then their sum is also integrable, and the integral of the sum equals the sum of the integrals. Furthermore, if you multiply a function f by some constant alpha, you also multiply its integral by alpha. And finally, if f is everywhere no greater than g, the integral of f is less than or equal to the integral of g. These results all look pretty obvious, and in fact, they're easy to prove. Uh, I'm going to do just the first of these. And following the style for this term, I will first give you a completely written out version of the proof, and then I'll turn to a blank sheet of paper and do it from scratch the way you might choose to do it when working for the proof logger. So what do we want to prove? We want to prove that the integral of a sum is equal to the sum of the integrals. And first we need to remind ourselves of the definition of the sum of two functions. The definition of the function f plus g is that for any point x in the domain, the value of that function is f of x plus g of x. Now let's choose a set of cubes that includes the entire support of f plus g. Since this support is bounded for f and bounded for g, this is just going to be a finite set of cubes. And for each of those cubes, if I evaluate f plus g at any point in the cube, that's equal to f evaluated at that point plus g evaluated at that point. The value of f cannot exceed its supremum. The value of g cannot exceed its supremum. And so if we ask, what's the supremum? of f plus g. It's the least upper bound of this quantity. That is, it's less than or equal to the supremum of f plus the supremum of g. Now what do we do with that? We say to evaluate the integral, we have to construct a term for each cube by multiplying by the volume of the cube. And then we have to sum over all the cubes. And when we start with the supremum and sum over all cubes, we get the upper sum. And therefore, the upper Riemann sum for f plus g is less than or equal to the sum of the upper Riemann sum for f and the one for g. And a very similar argument shows that the lower sum for f plus the lower sum for g is less than or equal to the lower sum for f plus g. But this is a similar, not an identical argument, because if we're talking about the infimum, what we can say is if we take the infimum of f plus g, the worst that can happen is f and g have their smallest value at the same point, in which case we get the sum of the infimum of f and the infimum of g. Most of the time, that will not be the case. Most of the time, the infimum of f plus g will actually be larger than the sum of the infima. But when we sum over all the cubes, again, we get the lower sum for f plus the lower sum for g is no greater than the lower sum for f plus g. Since the lower sum uses the infimum, the upper sum uses the supremum which is always at least as large as the infimum. The upper sum is going to be greater than or equal to the lower sum. And we've shown that that's less than or equal to u sub, f, u sub n for f plus u sub n for g. 
Now we've been told that f is integrable. That means that L sub n of f and U sub n of f approach the same limit. We know that g is integrable. So its lower sum and upper sum also approach the same limit. That means that the term on the left and the term on the right approach the same limit as n approaches infinity. And by the squeeze lemma, which you proved last term, both these quantities, which are squeezed in between the left-hand quantity and the right-hand quantity, approach that same limit. What is that common limit? It's the sum of the integral of f and the integral of g. So there's a quick run through of the proof. Now let's do it from scratch. In some ways, the hardest part of this proof is getting tech to draw the diagram for you. If you look at the tech source for this, you will see the trick whereby one can get a diagram to appear on one side of the page and uh, a block of text to appear on the other side of the page. So let's get started with the proof. What are we given? We are given that f and g are integrable functions. Uh-oh, what have I done? Help. Ah, got rid of it. So we are given that f and g integrable. And what does this mean? Well, it means three things. It means that both these functions are bounded. and that they both have bounded support. Why is that important? It means we only need a finite number of dyadic cubes in order to evaluate the integral of f plus g because of bounded support. And furthermore, in each of those cubes, since f has a supremum and g has a supremum, f plus g will also have a supremum. But that's not the whole story. The fact that f and g are integral means one other thing. It means that if I evaluate the lower sum for f and take the limit as f approaches infinity, I get the same value that I would get by starting with the upper sum and letting n approach infinity. And the same thing is true for the function g. What do we need to prove?
what we need to prove is that if I form the lower sum for f plus g and take the limit as l as n approaches infinity, I get the same result as I would get by using the upper sums. Okay, we'll choose a bunch of cubes. that include the support of the function f plus g. That's what I'm trying to illustrate with this diagram. If one of these ellipses denotes the support of f and the other depicts the support of g, this rather strangely shaped region here denotes the support of f plus g, and here is a representative cube let's call it a, it's in the support of the function f plus g. It's entirely possible that f might be identically 0 in that cube or that g might be identically 0 in that cube, but one or the other of the functions at least is going to have some non-zero values there. So let's think about cube a. And let's think about a typical point inside the cube A. What can we say? We can say that the function f plus g evaluated at x is equal to f of x plus g of x. That's the definition of the sum of two functions after all. f of x cannot exceed the supremum of the function f over that cube. That's the definition of supremum. And g of x cannot exceed the, the supremum of g over the cube a. So what's the largest possible value of f plus g evaluated on points in the cube a? Well, on the one hand, that's what we mean by the supremum of f plus g over the cube. On the other hand, we've just shown that there's an upper bound to this, namely the sum of the supremum of f and the supremum of g, and if we sum over all the cubes to get the upper Riemann sum, we will find that no matter how finely we divide, no matter what value of capital N we choose, the upper sum for f plus g is less than or equal to the upper sum for f plus the upper sum for g. That's a good start. Now let's think about the infimum. Well, what's the smallest possible value for f plus g over a cube. The smallest value we could possibly get would be if f and g both achieve their minimum value at exactly the same point, in which case the minimum value of f plus g would equal 
the minimum value of f plus the minimum value for g. Most of the time, that won't happen, though. Most of the time, what will happen is that the minimum value of f plus g over some cube a will be bigger than the sum of the minimum value of f and g. So what we can say in general is that the infimum of f plus g is always greater than or equal to the infimum of f plus the infimum of g. And when we sum over all the cubes to get the lower Riemann sum, we will conclude that the lower Riemann sum for f plus g is greater than or equal to the lower Riemann sum for f plus the lower Riemann sum for g. Now, we want the smallest things on the left. So let's start with lower sum for f plus lower sum for g. We just proved that's less than or equal to the lower sum for f plus g. For any function, the lower sum, which uses the infimum, cannot possibly exceed the upper sum, which uses the supremum. And we also showed that the upper sum for f plus g is less than or equal to the upper sum for f plus the upper sum for g. We're not taking any limits. This is true for all integer values of capital M. Now let's think about what happens as n approaches infinity. We know that f is integrable. What that means is that the lower sum and the upper sum both approach the same limit. And that limit is what we mean by the integral over, we're working in R2 here, the integral of f dx dy. And the same thing is true for g. Since g is integral, the lower sum for g and the upper sum for g both approach the same limit, which is the integral over r2 of g. Now think back to the first term, where you actually proved the squeeze lemma. The squeeze lemma says that if you have a quantity that's squeezed in between some sequence on the left and some sequence on the right, the quantity in the middle approaches the same limit as the quantity on the left and the quantity on the right. So by the squeeze lemma, The two quantities in the middle the lower sum for m f plus g and the upper sum for f plus g both approach the limit of that and the limit of that 
In other words, they both approach the integral of f plus the integral of g. And we're done, since the lower sum and the upper sum for f plus g approach a common limit. That means that f plus g is integrable. And since we know what that common limit is, we know the value of that Riemann integral, namely the integral of f plus g is equal to the integral of f plus the integral of g. That one proof is the full content of this video. And I will have one more video doing a second proof. And we will have thwarted the blizzard of 2015.